Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, Episode 7 of our RSVP Connections or Natural Resource Webinar Series. Uh, my name is Rose Clark. I'm an AmeriCorps Conservation Corps member working with the uh, University of Minnesota Extension Regional Sustainable Development Partnership. My role this year is um, very, a very large scope. It's to support the natural resource work groups across all five regions. Um, of the state of Minnesota. But what that's come down to in a lot of cases is communication and uh, making sure that we're sharing, um, you know, challenges, lessons learned, um, resources across the state and, um, and across our groups. Uh, so this webinar series, um, today we're going to be hearing from Karen Terry, who's an extension educator with the uh, water resources team. Um, and then Andy Hubley with the Arrowhead Regional Development Commission. He's going to be sharing a little bit about a project out of northeast Minnesota, um, the Cook County Comprehensive Trails Plan. Um, so this, this series was created in, uh, we started it in March 2016, and this is our seventh one. Um, it's really meant to help connect people to other uh, regions to kind of share the things that we're doing across the state for people that are involved with the partnerships and people that are interested in being involved. And it's also to um, connect to our university partners, um, do more of that inreach to understand fully um, what these folks in the university are doing and how we might be able to work with them to connect them to projects. Um, so the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships helps to support community-driven sustainability projects um, in greater Minnesota. Um, in this webinar, if you're joining us live on WebEx, uh, you'll see on the right-hand side a little arrow and tab that says chat. I will um, invite all of you to write questions or comments for the presenters in that chat box throughout the session, um, and I'll kind of moderate those questions and ask them of the presenters either at the end of their presentation um, or at the end of our session today. Um, at the very end of the session, we'll have a short poll, just a couple questions to kind of get some feedback on what you found valuable to help guide our future, our future um, webinars. And uh, this session is also being recorded, so you can find it later for future reference or to pass it on to other folks um, at uh, by by next by next week. You can find it on our webinar home site um, or at our YouTube page, our SCP YouTube. Um, great. I think that's, that's all the things that I have to share to get it started. Um, we're going to start today with hearing from Karen Terry. Karen, I'll pass you the presenter ball. All right. You can uh, go ahead and share your presentation. I hope so. <laughs> okay. That didn't work. It went to my other monitor. Let me go back here a second. Okay. It decided to go to the other one. Okay. Let's try that. Um, I can give a little bit of a an intro. So Karen Karen is one of our um, active South, Southwest region um, natural resource work group members. Um, she is famous for going around the state with her really awesome um, stream table. Is that what it's called, Karen? It is, yeah. Yes. Really yeah. awesome um, stream table, yeah. It is super awesome. I've seen her uh, share this uh, learning resource with lots of groups of, of um, kids and I imagine adults too to show how um, stream flow affects the landscape. And uh, we're, I'm sure we're going to hear more things that you do too, but that's the thing that I see most often. <laughs> that's one of them. So, do you see my first slide now? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. So, I will jump right in. Um, I am with the water resources team within Extension. And so, I want to talk to you about what that team does. Um, and so I will step through these things. I'll have my contact information again at the end if somebody um, wants to get in touch with me for anything. 
So I am with the Minnesota Extension Water Resources Team. So on the left there you see there's the Extension Center for Agriculture, Food, and Natural Resources. I am, my team is a part of that. And on the right side, the Water Resources Center, which is an entity within the university itself on St. Paul campus. We are also associated with them. So we put those two things together and we get the Extension Water Resources Team. There's the mission of our team. Really with all of Extension, the goal is to connect community needs and university resources. So what's coming out of the university that's going to help people out in the rest of the state? And we specifically do that to address Minnesota's critical water resources issues by providing and modeling effective education to ensure safe and sustainable water resources. So it's about how do we help people make better decisions and take better um, management actions for things that affect our water. So here's the team. There are six of us on the team. Um, John Bellotta is in the Farmington office, and I'll get into the programs that they are in later. Okay, this isn't good. I think I lost power. Oh, that's not good. Sorry, Karen. Good. Um, I can still nope. hear you, and we can still okay. see your screen. It's, oh, you can. Good. It came back on, so we're okay. Good, um, good. <laughs> and I've got to get it all on backup, I guess, so we're okay. So um, I'll talk about the programs later, but just for the people, we have John Bellotta in Farmington, um, also works with Sea Grant in Duluth. We have Eleanor Burkett in Brainerd, uh, Doug Malchow in a Rochester office, Shara Masagi is in Farmington with John, uh, me, I'm in the Morris um, Regional Center, and Megan Weber is our newest hire, and she's at Andover. So six of us covering the state here. Um, so we just this week, this is so exciting, just this week we launched our new web pages. So this is a screenshot from our new web page. Um, pretty exciting, a little bit of a change in focus on that, but that's the top half of the web page. And when I move forward here, you, oh, there's our web link there. Um, here you can see the lower part of the page, and I'm going to zoom in on that part, education for professionals, because our workshops, the work that we are doing out and about, is almost all happening in, in that category. So I'll zoom in on that education for professionals, and you see we have four programs listed there. So NEMO, on-site sewage treatment, stormwater education, and watershed education. So um, this is a little bit tricky because the on-site sewage treatment I'm not going to talk about because it actually is a university program, not through Extension, but we link it here because it's so central to what we do. And then there's another one that we do that is not listed here, and that's the Aquatic Invasive Species, which is in partnership with another organization and I'll talk about. So we, this is, you know, it's not all nice and clean and tidy as far as who belongs where because we do have these partnerships with other groups. So. Um, it's a good thing, but it makes things a little bit confusing for people outside of our group sometimes. Okay, so I'm going to go through each one of those. I'm going to start talking about NEMO. NEMO is um, um, led by John Bellotta on our team. NEMO is Nonpoint Education for mun Municipal Officials. So what that means is that we work with local elected and appointed officials to help them understand um, how water works in their communities, how the water is moving, um, how the pollution is moving, how we might do things differently to protect or improve our water. So NEMO is very much focused in the seven county metro area. That's where John works on it, um, not exclusively, but pretty much that's where the focus is. So I'll come back to that later when we get to another program, but this one has um, historically been in the Twin Cities metro area. Um, a lot of the work that they do is um, city council people, for example, going out and, and um, getting together and learning about what's in their own community. Another piece of this is the watershed game. I'm going to guess that some of you have played the watershed game. We use this a lot with these elected and appointed officials. Well, we use it a lot with a lot of different groups, actually. So the watershed game has been out for quite a few years now, and it really helps people understand that it's a, a bigger issue than just pointing upstream and saying, just fix that thing up there and we'll all be okay. That it's really a lot more complicated. And this game, it's really a board game, 
helps people understand some of those complexities and how we have to balance out what we want with the resources, the, the financial and staff resources that we have, and how we can um, maximize that to get the most bang for our buck. We just in the last year or so have released the classroom version of the watershed game. So it is for use with um, primarily high school students. You could go a little younger than that. Really, it's a, it's, the way you play is much different. The idea behind it is very much the same. So we're very excited to have that classroom version available. Okay, here's some examples. I think I clicked that. Okay, here's some examples of how we um, how we use Nemo, where we are using Nemo. So in that upper left picture, that's a, a picture of me playing the watershed game with a group of people around the table there, and we're on a boat. So we do Nemo on the water, workshops on the water, where we take these elected and appointed officials and actually take them out on a dinner, dinner cruise. But during the dinner cruise, we teach them all kinds of things about what's going on in that area and what's happening with the water. So it's a nice uh, venue for them to come together and it's relaxed and they get the chance to meet some of their um, some of the people that, that they maybe haven't met before that they're working on the same issues so it's really really a nice way to, to do some work then the upper right hand corner is at a conference we were doing the watershed game there lower left corner is um, a, a couple of people talking at one of those Nemo on the water boats Nemo on the water uh, trips and then in the lower right we um, another um, topic that we cover a lot is working with communities about issues specifically such as road salt. How do we control how much road salt gets put on the road and how do we keep it out of the water? So some of those things happen um, during workshops that we offer too. Okay, so now I'm going to switch. That was Nemo. I'm going to switch to a, another program that we do and that's the Watershed Education Program. This program, which we call WEP, is um, really very much like the NEMO program in the metro area, but it's for rural areas. So we are working um, a lot more with the local and appointed, local elected and appointed officials in rural areas to deal with some of the same kind of issues in their smaller towns and with the ag land and how do we pull those things together. A lot of that work, we frame it up in terms of watersheds because that's the way the state agencies have moved. So you can see on the left there the map that popped up. This is if you're familiar with the 10-year approach of, of watershed assessment. It's the RAPS, Watershed Restoration and Protection Strategy. So they're doing this statewide. So every, every year they start in eight to 10 watersheds around the state and go through this 10-year cycle. So all of the watersheds now have started and are somewhere on that timeline. So there's all this energy going on around what's happening in my watershed and what's happening in my next door watershed. And so it's a great opportunity for us in extension to be able to partner with some of the folks uh, leading those efforts so we can work with the local people to bring their uh, understanding of watersheds up to a common point so we are speaking the same language. The same is true with the One Watershed, One Plan. It's a, another effort going on where um, we're, we're involved in that as well. So what does that look like? Some of the recent work that we have done with that, in the upper, well, at the top of the page there, we did the Minnesota Association of Townships Spring Short Courses. We did 15 presentations in 15 days um, to all township officials. So these are people who we would assume do not have a background, uh, uh, um, you know, formal education in natural resources or water. Um, certainly there are exceptions to that, but a lot of these folks have jobs as township officials where they're making decisions about things like road maintenance and building bridges and installing culverts and things that affect our water, so we're helping them make better decisions. Similar in that lower left-hand corner, we did um, some workshops for uh, MS4 communities, so this is a federal designation where when they get to a certain size or certain things trigger them, they are designated as an MS4 community. Um, which means that they have to adhere to certain rules. So we did some workshops for communities that were just newly designated to help them understand what that meant for them. What do we have to do different now that we have this, this title on us? And then on the, oh, the lower right, there's that amazing stream table that I use quite a bit. And this is a picture from when I had it at the River Watch, which is a program with high school students that they do in the Red River Valley. So um, different tools and different ways that we use this work. 
So the third program I'm going to talk about is the stormwater education program. And this one is um, a little bit different than the first two. This one is really geared toward a professional audience instead of those elected and appointed officials. So the professionals who need to know things like um, the technical side of how much road salt to apply, how do I build a rain garden, how do I decide where to install it, how do I monitor these things after I've installed them. So I think I'll zoom in on that. You can see kind of four different categories of programs that we offer within the stormwater education program. Stormwater U is really a lot about um, those professionals need to get a certain number of continuing education hours. They need to be trained in, in certain things on a recurring basis. And so we offer classes that meet those needs. Uh, upper right corner, we're doing an environmental statistics workshop series where we got a lot of feedback from people saying, we need to know how to use statistics um, and we don't remember what we learned or we haven't used it since we got out of college and we need some refreshers. So we did some introductory classes and then we realized there was also a need for follow-up advanced classes. So we're doing those as well. Um, the lower right there, the P8 modeling is an example of there are some um, very specific kind of modeling softwares out there that people are using. There's P8 and there's Bathtub and there's Flux32. I can say these words, I really don't know about these models, but my teammates do because they're teaching these classes. So there are people out there, those professionals, who need to know how to run these models in their areas, and so we offer that training for them to get up to speed on that. And the last one, that lower left-hand corner, is, is fairly new, and we are very excited about this. It's a, a Stormwater Practices and Maintenance Core course. It's an online course for people to use to really build their understanding of stormwater, um, stormwater source, storm, stormwater management, stormwater monitoring. So they go through this online course, and it's not even just for Minnesota, but it was built with a more of a regional um, feel to it. So we get people from all over the place signing up and taking that course. It's uh, um, something that people do on their own time, not a set schedule. You don't go through the cohort. Everybody does it individually. So we're very excited about that. So here's an example of that first one, the practices inspection and maintenance certification. So this is, these are professionals that need to get certified in a certain area of stormwater management. So we offer classes to meet those needs and, and we do these throughout the year. Here's the, uh, also an example of at the top, that flux and bathtub. I think bathtub is the funniest name, but it's a model that they run to to um, determine what kind of practices to put on the land for stormwater. The lower left is that statistics workshop. So we've done a, a, quite a few of those in the last couple of years, and we've got another one coming up in November. Here's that uh, stormwater practices and maintenance core course. This is just a screenshot from that. So this is available if people are interested in that. Um, I can certainly get you more information about it, but totally online course. Okay, so then remember I said that we have the uh, one program that wasn't listed on that first shot I had at the, on our website. So that is our Aquatic Invasive Species Program. So they are partnered with this, the, what, the website that you see up now is the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center, which is MACERC. So our group, and that would be Eleanor and Megan, they work with this group through our program. And the specifically what they are doing, here's their website at the bottom, specifically what Eleanor and Megan are working on is developing an AIS, which is Aquatic Invasive Species, AIS detector program, where they um, are creating a network of volunteers who will go out and be uh, very intentionally watching for new instances of aquatic invasive species. So we, are, we will offer training on that. These are brand new in development programs that there will be training for people to learn how to be good detectors and then to run that program of um, collecting the information and, and uh, managing the volunteer base. So that's the AIS, Aquatic Invasive Species Detector Program. We are also at the same time developing an AIS tracker program. So once we know, for instance, that we have zebra mussels in West Battle Lake in Ottertail County, 
we know that, we've identified that, then how do we track that through the years? So that's a different program um, where we can uh, have some of the same volunteers or different volunteers who will monitor that over time and report back to us. So these are programs that are really gonna um, tie in well with Department of Natural Resources and that MACERC uh, Research Center to be able to do some very um, rigorous citizen science so we collect that information and share it back where it's gonna be really valuable. So all of the programs that we're doing, so we have the NEMO, the Watershed Education Program, the Stormwater Education Program, and the Aquatic Invasive Species Program, all of those, the, the, the goal overall is to improve and protect the water in the state of Minnesota. So we really have that, that same goal running through all of those. We also have, in addition to the Watershed Game, which is a publication of ours, we also have two other publications um, that I want to highlight. And the, the one on the left there is our newsletter from Shore to Shore. It's a bi-monthly newsletter, and we focus on having um, um, articles about research that's going on, things that people can do um, on their own properties. Um, maybe uh, sometimes we highlight specific species to say, what about that zebra mussel? What is, you know, what's the issue with zebra mussels? A whole range of different things, but everything centered around water resources. The publication on the right, The Fields to Streams, is uh, fairly new. It's been out well, less than a year now. Um, it is really a, a manual that we created for um, natural resource professionals who are working in the field, maybe working one-on-one -on -one with landowners or working in groups to try to explain to them um, some of the practices that we'd like to see put on the ground. And we put this together to have a tool for them to use to help them explain these things better. So it's filled, filled with graphics and, and photos and other resources that they can use. We developed it, it's a, a PDF, you can download it. We have some print copies. We did not really um, design it to be used primarily as a print copy or print document, but also we know that a lot of these people are using um, tablets out in the field. So we developed it so they can have it on their tablet and, and be able to share that information with the landowners right there in the field. So we're very excited about both of those too. So uh, I think that's all I have. Yes, that's all I have. There's my contact information. I would be happy to talk to any of you about the programs that we have to offer. Um, and I don't know, R Rose, if you want to do questions now, if there are any, or if we should uh, go right on to Andy. Yeah, um, so there are a couple questions. Um, I, I was wondering, I, I'm hoping to maybe be able to play the watershed game with um, either regional uh, groups or at our statewide coordinating committee um, meeting in November. Uh, but I was wondering if you had any um, stories or, or specific examples of changes that were made on a local level as a result of the game and the things that they learned. Well, I would say that the, the thing that I always notice about when we play the game is if we're in a room of people and we say we're going to play a game, we always have one or two or three people who step back and fold their arms and <laughs> sort of remove themselves from the group. And I totally get this because I would probably be one of those people doing that because I'm not going to sit down and play some silly game. You know, you're not going to make me do something with a group. But once we draw them into the game, by the time we're even a third of the way into it, pretty much everybody's got their elbows on the table and they're having the conversation. And I think this is so valuable on multiple levels because we have people in the room, they're almost always um, neighbors, um, city council people that are on the council together. You know, these people are connected to each other in ways that maybe I'm not connected to anybody in the room, you know, regionally, geographically, but they are. And so it helps them start having that conversation about, oh, I see what you're saying there. Yeah, we could talk about that. But the other thing is, is that it, I think, really goes a long way toward making people see the issues from that 10,000 foot level. Instead of looking out the back door and seeing, I have a problem right here, it forces them as a group to really step back and look at it as a watershed and say, oh yeah, we have some problems in this watershed and 
even though I have a problem outside my front door, maybe it's not the biggest problem in the watershed, and maybe we need to work together to fix something else or to pool our resources together um, to address a, an issue at a higher level. So that's the change I see again and again and again, is people come to the table sometimes skeptical and not really anxious to jump in. But by the time we're done, everybody's jumping in. Yeah, that's wonderful. It's really powerful. Um, there's another question about one of the resources you shared, the Field to Streams publication. Yes. Um, the question is, have you used it with landowners yet? And if so, how have they responded? Well, it's pretty new. I do know that we, we send copies to all of the Soil and Water Conservation District offices, and I have heard that they are using it. I don't have any specific stories about how that's playing out for them. Um, we're going to meet with a bunch of them probably in October and have that discussion. But um, I do know that it's getting used quite a bit. People have been requesting multiple copies, so I know that they're seeing a lot of value in it. But yeah, so the, the way we want it to be used and what they actually, what those land managers were calling for was we need something that we can show these people instead of just standing there talking to them one-on-one. -on -one. You know, I think a lot of us are very visual learners. I certainly am. And so if you have a graph to show me or a map of the state to show me while you're explaining something to me, it goes a long way. And so we package this in a way that they can go right to the section that's of interest to them, whatever topic it is they're addressing, they can go to that section and, and find the resources. So really excited about it. Yeah, it's a pretty awesome publication. Um, we had Ann Lewandowski on for the very first webinar, actually, yeah. back in March, and right. she shared she shared those publications. But I think she was saying that part two of the Fields to Streams publication just came out around that time, right? In, in February or March? Yeah. yeah, they're both available. So it's a part one and part two. And part one is really the kind of the nuts and bolts, how do these, you know, the big concept ideas. And part two is more of the best management practices. Okay, so we know we have to uh, install grass buffers. How do we do that? And why do we do that? Why grass buffers, you know, or whatever it is. So it's more of the um, how-to sort of thing in the second one. If I can, I'd like to highlight one more um, program that we do, and that is the Watershed Specialist Training. That is an online course as well, um, run through the Water Resources Center and Lewandowski, and I teach that together. And so it is geared, again, toward those uh, land managers primarily, especially people who are maybe um, new to the, you know, new, um, hires or new to working in the world of water. So we get people started from the ground up and we cover things like watershed science, the, the um, real science of the hydrology, but we also cover things like communication and civic engagement and monitoring and assessment. And we, we walk them through a lot of different projects where they start from how do we collect the data? How do we identify gaps first? Then what do we collect? What do we do with that? How do we put together a plan and then implement that plan? So we've really had a lot of success with that program too. And we offer that on a semester basis. It is a cohort. So when people sign up, they go through uh, 14 weeks together, but all online to, to learn these things together. Excellent, thank you. That's great. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm Glad to have this opportunity, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody that got more questions. Okay. Yeah, there are a couple other questions, but I think there are ones that maybe would be good to pose to both you and Andy. So maybe we'll hear from Andy and then come back to those um, okay. at the end. Good. I will stop so, sharing here, and I think yeah. I can pass it back to you. Um, I'll actually just pass it straight to Andy. Okay. Perfect. Um, and yeah, Andy, so Andy Hubley is the, as I said before, the director of regional, of the regional planning division of um, Arrowhead Regional Development Commission. And they are a frequent partner with the Northeast region of the, of RSTP. Um, and yeah, I've, I've seen many great results of their projects. Uh, I'm excited to hear more about this one in particular, uh, a trails plan, which is kind of I think on on the minds of a lot of communities around the state. So Andy, take it away. 
Okie doke. Uh, thanks a lot. I appreciate uh, this opportunity. Um, again, Andy Hubley with ARDC, the Arrowhead Regional Development Commission. And uh, we are one of just uh, what was originally 10 RDCs around the state. We cover seven counties in northeast Minnesota. Um, most of the state is covered by an RDC. Um, and there are comparable agencies and folks, planners like myself, um, that can help out in a variety of ways. Um, ARDC has uh, become trail specialists at some point. I'm not sure when that happened, um, but it's one of the more fun uh, chores that we have is working with trails. And uh, we help communities uh, plan and uh, implement trail projects. And it's something that we've done for a while. Um, we're very involved in active living and other health uh, initiatives as well, uh, which are, can be associated with trails. And so, uh, like I said, it's a pretty fun project that we get to work on. I was asked today to talk about the Cook County Comprehensive Trails Plan. Cook County uh, is on the tip of the arrowhead. Without Cook County, there would be no point to Minnesota, is what they say. I'm not sure about that. Um, the uh, Cook County includes the Grand Portage uh, Band of Ojibwe. Their reservation is, uh, is at the tip of the state um, in uh, one, of most, one of the most beautiful spots that a lot of people don't realize even exists. It's almost uh, an alpine environment on the Grand Portage area, and you should check it out. The uh, trails plan was initiated by the county. Um, we help them uh, get funding from a variety of sources. We often work with the Regional Sustainable Development Partnership here in the northeast area of the state, and we've been partnering with them uh, many times over the years on trail projects. And uh, one of the things that we've done with them in particular is design projects for trailheads, waysides, um, little parks, things like that, that we've implemented uh, on the North Shore and other places of getting uh, smaller towns primarily uh, started on a big improvement project and uh, seeing that through implementation. We just finished up uh, last year creating a wayside in Beaver Bay, Minnesota. If you've been up to the shore, you can check out that new wayside. It's wonderful. And uh, it was a 10-year project in the, uh, as we went through it. So it doesn't happen overnight, um, but we're proud to say that one uh, is uh, operating and helping that community economically and helping folks enjoy the North Shore. Um, the Cook County Comprehensive Trails Plan um, started out, I think, as a small project, ended up a very large project. I think the plan document is 67 pages. I'm not going to read it word for word today, um, which I'm sure you appreciate. But I will go through it here and talk about the process. The county asked us to facilitate this process and write the document. Um, so often in most counties, I think this kind of thing occurs where groups of people are coming to the county board for uh, support of their project, either through funding or just a letter of support as they apply for grants. Um, and the county boards, I think, feel um, how do they know which projects uh, uh, are good projects that they should support? Um, what is the priority of this project? And having this comprehensive trails plan that looks at all kinds of trails for every jurisdiction, uh, every use, um, and going through uh, the, with those citizen groups as to what their priorities are, the county board ends up with this document that helps them make decisions in the future. Um, and one of the things that we've seen with these comprehensive trails plan, we also did one for Lake County, is uh, the funding agencies uh, through legacy funds, DNR, what have you, um, really appreciate the fact that they know the county has uh, and the citizens group have participated, participated in a process um, with the public and that these projects have been vetted. The county board and knows these projects and supports these projects. And so it makes them easier to fund knowing that this planning process has been behind it. So I'll quickly go through the, uh, the plan. It ended up much larger than we ever anticipated. Um, we got into a lot more detail, I think, than we anticipated, but it really did end up being a, a solid plan that talks about everything, essentially. You know, we included, at times, we had to, like, is that, is that really a trail we'd talk about? And it was something like a rock climbing. Uh, should rock climbing be in a comprehensive trails plan? 
uh, in the end it wasn't, but those are the types of uh, detailed discussions we had, and you can see how it could grow really fast. Um, one of the primary things, I'll talk about that a little later, that this plan addresses is new uses. Um, there's still people coming up with new ways to recreate every year. Um, for example, we have to talk about fat tire winter biking in this plan, whereas 10 years ago that wouldn't have been a discussion. Um, so that kind of makes things fun too, fun too is, is looking at new ideas. Um, so the plan in ARDC, we're, we're planners and we tend to uh, embrace a public process um, that looks 10 to 20 years in the future and uh, talks about um, what the priorities are and how to fund those projects. And so you kind of go with an inventory first, what do we have, and then go into uh, developing recommendations for improvements. Um, so the first part of the plan is uh, talking about the process. Um, one of the things that Cook County, we had a trail committee, it was uh, county officials and then leaders of uh, all the user groups, snowmobile club, et cetera, were invited to participate on this community committee and we had really good attendance. Um, we also had the jurisdictions, the national forest folks, state folks, et cetera, um, and everybody was participating. One of the things that this task force, the committee, really leaned on throughout the process was the goals that they had set up um, and talking about how does this impact the goals when we're talking about different projects. And you can see the goals there uh, in the document. Um, we made it kind of a short one word goal, which was interesting. Um, connected, collaborative, multi-use, integrated, safe, manageable, economically beneficial, and sustainable. Um, and so we looked at all projects against the, uh, the goals and made sure that the projects um, contributed to those goals. And you can see the further definitions there uh, for details, but they're pretty straightforward. Uh, we met several times with the committee. We had a public meeting at the beginning in which uh, we sought input and then a public meeting at the end in which we uh, uh, shared the plan and, uh, and accepted comments. We did receive quite a few public comments on the plan and made changes based on those comments, so the public was quite engaged. Um, the other thing in the trails plan that I think people aren't as uh, cognizant of sometimes is all the related facilities. And in fact, we're discovering, a, we're doing a mountain bike plan, or just finished a mountain bike plan up in uh, Lake County by Split Rock, and we the associated facilities to construct are actually going to be much more expensive than the trail itself. Um, the parking lots, changing rooms, et cetera, those are actually more uh, expensive and challenging to fund than the trails themselves. So we do talk about associated facilities um, with trails and we go through it by jurisdiction. We have federal, state, which includes state parks, um, Cook County, um, is 92% publicly owned. So between the federal government, the uh, Band of Ojibwe, the state government, county government, city, 92% of the county is in public ownership, which makes this plan probably unique compared to most uh, comprehensive trails plans you'd see on a countywide basis because primarily uh, working with the Forest Service, which owns most of the property in Cook County. Um, you know, they have their policies that are different than maybe what the county would have, and the state has different policies than what they have. So integrating, when you have a trail, you have a snowmobile trail, for example, that crosses into three jurisdictions, you have to coordinate all those jurisdictions. Um, so it can be challenging. The good news is, is acquiring property for trails is, a, is maybe the biggest challenge in other areas of the state. That really isn't the issue in Cook County because it's already publicly owned. Um, so that does kind of a unique thing that maybe other folks wouldn't see, but it certainly made for an interesting project. So we have yeah, federal, state, um, there's actually very few county facilities. There's county property, but most of it's not improved in any way. Um, we talk about waysides, parks, 
water accesses, water trails are a big thing in, in Cook County with the Boundary Waters Canoe area and other facilities, other uh, resources there. Um, Lutzen Mountains, the ski area, um, is an entity unto itself, um, but integrates with a lot of the trails. Uh, we talk about the communities that are in the county. Cook County is unique. There's actually only one incorporated city, Grand Marais, in Cook County. Um, we do talk about townships, and there's places on a map uh, that maybe not uh, aren't incorporated, but they do have a community uh, such as Lutzen or Tofty. Um, we talk about trail marketing. We're very lucky to have visit Cook County is uh, dedicated to the entire county's tourism, um, so we match up well with their jurisdiction, um, and they were a good partner for this whole project. We talk about private businesses. Again, Cook County, primarily through the Boundary Waters Canoe area, has a lot of outfitters, and now we find those outfitters are often renting more than just canoes. They're bikes, kayaks, skiing, uh, anything you'd ever want. You know, if you don't want to purchase it, you can rent it in Cook County if you want to enjoy the trails. Then we finally uh, got to talk about the actual trails themselves. Um, we go through it by use, even though some facilities are multi-use, and so the trail segments are kind of repeated. Um, snowmobiling is still big in Cook County. ATV, OHV use is increasing in the county. Um, there's been uh, a lot of uh, changes in policies regarding ATVs. You can pretty much uh, legally drive an ATV on any county road now, and the Forest Service is opening more roads to ATV use as time moves on here. And so ATV use and, and uh, facilities are discussed, um, although there's actually only a few designated trails for ATVs. There's a lot of roads designated for ATV use, but the purpose-built trails are very few, um, which comes into play when we're talking with that uh, organiza or the organizations uh, promoting ATV use. Hiking, walking, and running, this plan got into more than just your traditional hiking trails. It also talks about sidewalks and connections, getting you, for, for example, from your hotel room right onto the trail without having to get in your car and go to a trailhead. Um, that was a priority for the county and still is. So we talk about road shoulders and uh, sidewalks as well. Um, one thing that people, uh, if you're from around the state, uh, the North Country Trail, is the uh, long distance trail from uh, North Dakota to New York, or New York to North Dakota, depending on your perspective. Uh, that uses trails in Cook County, the Spear Hiking Trail, the Border Out Hiking Trail, and the Kekakavik Trail are all designated as the North Country Trail. Um, west of the uh, uh, Ely area, the trail is on road shoulders, et cetera, et cetera, and that's something that in the Arrowhead region we'd like to uh, promote is getting the North Country Trail onto all hiking trails and uh, connecting to uh, parts in western Minnesota that already have hiking trails or uh, are seeking to build them as well. There's a lot of things that people don't think about. Hunter walking trails are designated a lot primarily in state forests and uh, you can hike them anytime you want. You don't have to go during a hunting season um, and so they're a resource so not, not a lot of people are aware of. Mountain biking. Mountain biking is uh, rapidly growing in the state of Minnesota, as many of you probably have noticed. Uh, Cook County has uh, a few purpose-built uh, mountain bike trails that are well used and uh, are very uh, well loved by residents and visitors. And the Forest Service has some roadways they've designated as mountain bike trails, but they're not purpose-built mountain bike trails, what we call single track. And for tourism purposes, you want to have single track. That is what draws the serious mountain biker, and mountain bikers uh, statistically are, are good spenders, um, comparable or even better than snowmobiling, which is thought to be always be a, a high spending uh, tourism uh, section, but mountain biking is very, very good, and we're looking to grow that all over the Arrowhead region. Gravel road cycling is something not a lot of people probably know about, but gravel grinding, as they call it, is very popular as well. There's now specific bikes just for gravel roads. 
There's multiple races in Cook County and in the, the rest of the Arrowhead region, and that's becoming very popular as well. And with the Forest Service roads, there's lots of opportunities to uh, uh, mountain bike or uh, gravel grind in Cook County. Uh, for each of the subject areas, the uses we talk about issues and opportunities, and those uh, are things that we analyzed out of the system that needed to be addressed, and we'll address that in the recommendations. Uh, paved bicycling, skinny tire bicycling, bicycling, excuse me. Um, right now in Cook County, we have the Gitchigami State Trail, uh, but most of it is yet to be constructed. Uh, building on the North Shore is incredibly expensive, and it's gone very slow, but we do add miles every year. In other areas of the state, with more paved roadways uh, and good shoulders, the uh, paved uh, trail bicycling, skinny tire bicycling can be very good. But primarily in Cook County, the recommendation is to finish the Gitchigami Trail. Skiing, cross-country skiing, uh, all kinds of opportunities in Cook County. There's one unique thing in Cook County in which a group of private businesses banded together and uh, worked it out with the Forest Service to build and maintain the trail uh, with the private businesses and they can charge a separate ski pass for people to use that and that's a unique public-private partnership. Water trails and paddling, good thing with water trails and paddling is it doesn't require any trail construction other than portages, but the associated facilities, parking lots, access points are important. We talked a lot about dog sledding. Uh, mushing uh, continues to grow as well. Um, mushers traditionally have not mapped out their trails and we're working with them to map out their trails so that uh, their trails aren't uh, uh, impacted by other uses. Again, I talked about fat tire biking earlier. Um, very little uh, infrastructure in place. The trails do have to be groomed to be effective um, and it's growing and there's people seeking to increase that uh, the trail capacity for fat tire biking and that, that will happen at some level over time. There's other things that uh, people could have talked about, scheduling, other types of trails that didn't quite make the cut as getting in the plan, but people did uh, note, note them. Snowshoeing, snowshoeing is unique because they're really built to get off the trail and hike in deep snow. Um, so snowshoeing wasn't a, a huge discussion point. <clears throat> Horseback riding is not a massive activity in Cook County, but it did come up quite a bit and there was more people interested in that than we anticipated, so that was a point of discussion too. Uniquely um, in a trail discussion, we talked a little bit about history and adding historical elements to trails and trailheads when they're constructed. You know, always looking out for what's the history of an area and to provide interpretation at those facilities, so that was interesting. And then in Cook County in particular, they have a thriving art community. I think uh, there's more artists in Cook County per capita than any other place in the nation, I think is what somebody said. I don't know how they found that out. I don't know, I think they have to register at the, uh, the artist uh, uh, registri registry. I'm not sure how that works, but uh, that's what I've been told. And they're very proud of their art, and they talk about in this plan adding art, public art, into the uh, the trail systems whenever possible, and local art. So then we get to the recommendations, and surprisingly we spent more time on policies than we thought we would, rather than actual trail construction or improvement, and uh, it was quite the discussion on a lot of different things. Cook County does not have a county park or trail department, and they're considering it after this plan creating that Parks and Trails Department, even though they have no facilities, they see a, a need to provide maintenance and things, even if that facility they want to maintain is on a different entity's uh, property, such as the state or the federal government. Um, the county may have a better ability to maintain facilities than those organizations, and uh, the county would consider creating a department to handle that. We talked a lot about collaborations, and we talk about specific collaborations that should be undertaken um, with the state and other folks. Um, so there was a lot of different policies that uh, uh, were talked about, and you can see, you can't read this, I'm assuming, but the uh, 
the table there shows all the policy recommendations that were done as part of this plan. The uh, second unique thing I think in this plan's recommendations was they want a series of trail hubs. They have primary hubs and secondary hubs. They want these hubs to have a visual connection to each other so that people know they're on a Cook County trail hub. Uh, primary hubs would serve multiple trail system and be used year round. It would have certain amenities uh, um, where possible water, uh, restrooms, et cetera. Secondary hubs would be smaller and potentially would just serve one trail system and not be used year round. Um, those are the large point of discussion too, is these trail hubs and how they would work. And uh, the, the discussion continues at the county. Um, so yeah, there's a list of trail hubs. We ended up with more trail hubs than I imagined we would. And I imagine that all of these will not be developed over time, that things will get prioritized. Mapping and GIS, mapping is a huge part of it. Uh, this plan actually had a subcommittee just to talk about mapping and working to create one trail map for the entire county and that work continues. Snowmobile trail recommendations, uh, trail hubs, parking, where you know, additional parking being needed. Uniquely for snowmobiles and potentially for ATVs is the need for private partnerships primarily to make sure that people have fuel, uh, opportunity to fuel up their snow machines and ATVs at regular basis so that they're not uh, stranded out there. And uh, those things were, were discussed. And actually very few snowmobile recommendations um, because the trail system is quite extensive and it didn't really seem like the folks were looking for additional trail as more just improvements to existing facilities. ATVs, um, not many actual designated trails, and they, those folks do seek purpose-built ATV trails. And uh, as a result of this project, the uh, ATV club up there is seeking to do a master plan just for ATV new trail construction and improvements. And those, uh, that plan will be forthcoming. Hiking trails, again, hiking trails are you know, ample opportunity for hiking in Cook County. There's very little call for a new trail. It was more just improvements of existing trails and primarily the facilities associated with those trails. Mountain biking, uh, there's a significant interest in building more mountain bike trails. It's said that you need about 50 miles of trails to really have an economic impact on a community. And I think right now they have 20 something, um, or 30 something, and they, are seeking ways to expand it to at least 50 miles and those efforts continue. The Superior Cycling Association actually did do a master plan, a smaller plan, <clears throat> just on uh, trail improvements and trail construction in the county. That was again the result of this planning process was that more detailed plan. One thing that's come up is bike packing, is having a trail system with campsites that you can bike to. Um, that is getting a lot more traction and interest from folks is having a bike packing system, trail system where you bike from campsite to campsite for a long distance like you were on a canoe trip or something like that. Road bicycling was very simple, finish the Gichigami Trail pretty much. Uh, ski trails, not a lot of call for new ski trails. There was some discussion on uh, improving existing ones and what the ski trail system really generated a whole discussion on maintenance and joint maintenance, you know, do you buy two of uh, two pieces of uh, an expensive equipment or do you buy one and share it between groups and the county is very interested in facilitating how equipment gets shared and other ways to create efficiencies in maintenance. And I think that was one of the more uh, uh, interesting and uh, uh, things that came out of this plan was the real desire to share costs for certain things when possible. Um, even just equipment storage, you know, why build, have two people build two buildings when you can build one building and house things. Um, and that was really interesting and I'm excited to see where that goes. Mushing, um, primarily just getting the trail systems on the map and making sure that those folks don't lose, lose use of those trails in the future. We had a whole chapter on fat tire biking. Um, a lot of interest in that and uh, wanting to designate more fat biking trails, um, taking existing trails and grooming them for fat tire biking. Um, that's 
challenging uh, in the national forest because of some environmental rules they have regarding grooming. Um, so what really came out of that was looking at other partners such as the state and county properties that can fill that fat biking niche. Paddling's pretty straightforward with the boundary waters and all the opportunities in Cook County. We do have history and art recommendations, again, to talk about where we add history and art into facilities where possible. We had a whole separate section for the Grand Portage uh, Reservation, their trails, and what they want to do, and those are listed in the plan as well. And we did add some horseback trails uh, recommendation in there just at the last minute as those folks were late to kind of identify what they wanted. There's some maps and a list of funding sources that these groups can use to go after uh, construction or, or improvement dollars. And uh, that's the plan. And it uh, hopefully is living on in the county. I know that they, uh, they can review it regularly with all the tables and kind of check off what's being done and uh, what's been completed. And uh, they can kind of follow through with that. Um, Lake County and Cook County both have done these plans and both have scored very well uh, with the Greater Minnesota Parks and Trails Commission funding process, like I said, and other funding sources because of the comprehensive trails plans and all the work that went in ahead of time prior to you know, seeking funding and making sure that all these projects were vetted and that everybody had a chance to work uh, or to comment on them. I know that was uh, pretty long. Uh, hopefully we have a few minutes for uh, questions here. Yeah, that was wonderful. Uh, website Thank you. there on the screen now, and uh, I'll throw it back to uh, Rose. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. That was great. That um, was really insightful. I like how how prevalent the fat tire biking was. Um, that's been coming up a lot uh, in the Grand Forks area and around Crookston too. So it's neat to hear that that's kind of all over. I should clarify um, on the fat tire biking that any bike I get onto is a fat bike. So. That's always my standard fat, fat biking joke. So there you go. Right. Um, we had a couple questions come in for you. Um, one of them is, can you say a little more about how this project connects to university and community partners? Um, what were the roles of, of, you know, anyone else that you worked with on this project? Well, the county staff participated pretty, uh, pretty well with their planning staff and their GIS folks. Our connection to the university, other than their partial funding, was we did use a UMD GIS intern um, on the mapping component. And I don't think I really highlighted it, but there's an entire on my, online mapping component to this that they're still working on. Um, so that was our connection to the university, is uh, keeping them informed as to what's going on uh, and uh, using the, the intern to help us out with the GIS. And, so that was good. All the Forest Service folks participated. They came to every meeting. It wasn't not just participation. There was a lot of, uh, you know, requests from the county for the Forest Service to officially comment on things and to read the document and change what they wanted to change as far as wording goes. So it was a lot of uh, people, you know, putting in time that they weren't getting uh, paid for through this process. And the process was really good at engaging people and uh, making sure that they had a chance to comment and, and help out with how the plan uh, read when it came to their subject areas. So we had clubs and, you know, entities, jurisdictions that participated. Awesome. Um, there's another question about um, the incorporating local art. Uh, is, are there any specific ideas for how to do this? Any things in the works? <clears throat> Not that I'm aware of. Yet, I mean, anytime I do a design process uh, for a trailhead, um, you know, with this idea, is we would look for space to put local art and to incorporate it into the design of a pro into the design of a trailhead. If you can imagine, you know, you have a retaining wall. Can it, you know, have an artistic component to that retaining re retaining wall sculpture? Is there just, uh, you know, things on the kiosk, posters, et cetera? Um, I don't think that they've spent a ton of time in how to incorporate local art, but they were pretty enthusiastic about it. Sorry, I need to unmute myself. Um, that's great. Thank you. Um, so I, I did open a poll. Uh, you might have seen it. 
if you are on WebEx right now, uh, please go ahead and answer those questions, um, how much you learned and what content was, was most interesting or valuable. Um, Andy and Karen, do you have a couple minutes if we go over our noon deadline? I have a couple more questions for you. Sure. I'm, I'm good, yeah. Okay. Um, so one, one more for Andy. Um, there, do you, how did you address the uh, potentially conflicting uses that you might encounter? For example, bird watching and ATV use or um, snowmobiles and groomed cross-country ski trails. Um, do, you, do you have a method for kind of um, addressing all, all angles? <clears throat> well, um, we had everybody in the room, so that, you know the the leaders of these different user groups um, were at the table when people were discussing improvements, and we facilitated that discussion. And there was a lot of back and forth. Um, in a lot of cases, the the public landowner has already separated a lot of these uses, um, and we continue to facilitate take that separation where possible. Um, we know that not everybody is going to be happy. Um, that comes with the territory when you're talking about trails and multi-use. Um, but I think the county stuck with the process and made sure that everybody's voice was heard and that they really uh, noted when separation of uses was important and they've worked on making sure those uses are kept separate. Um, we're lucky up here because of all the public land, we can spread out pretty good. And, uh, but also because of the public land, it, you know, they already have their rules, so the Forest Service has already you know, separated those uses. You have to have a permit to go into the boundary waters. Um, you know, they have a lot of you know, no motorized use signs here. Um, so I think that made it a little easier was that a lot of those uses have been separated. I think when the Cook County ATV Club does their own master plan and really dives into new areas, that will be a bigger point of discussion. And uh, I'm hoping they're going to use a public process to do that um, and so that people have their, they have their voice heard. Was there a second part to that question? I can't remember. Um, no, that was, that was the main one it, uh, in, in response to other RSTP funded projects addressing trails and um, and having that come up as a you know as a consideration. Um, I, you know, it, I was pleasantly surprised with how often people were willing to work together. Um, you know, there was the ideas of you know in summertime a trail might be non motorized, but in the wintertime it could be motorized, and or even actually more often it was you could take a motorized trail. Then um, in the summertime, and it could be a fat tire biking trail in the wintertime. Um, a lot of the groups said, you know, we'll try to expand our uses, number of uses, because the more uses we can add into a system, the more potential maintenance volunteers we have. So that was pretty funny. Is you know, it's like, yeah, heck, if the fat tire bikers want to pitch in and grab a shovel, they can sure as heck ride on our trail. Excellent. Thank you. Um, a couple more things. Uh, I, I was wondering if um, either of you had ideas about um, further um, further work with the partnerships, um, other opportunities for collaboration, um, any specific things in mind or general into the future working with the partnerships. Well, we've. Uh a lot of times these plans, again, we've done a lot of these design projects after the plan. So if you have a specific improvement, uh, we work with the partnerships to get landscape architects to uh, the community and actually design what that improvement could look like. And uh, we've been doing that for several years, and that's been our strongest uh, uh, association with the partnerships is working on those design projects which are always really fun because you get to kind of go out with a clean slate and imagine what you want. And uh, the community gets to, you know, gets to participate in that process. And uh, we've got a lot of designs out there. They're still waiting for funding. Um, but we plan to continue to work with the partnership on those efforts. 
Yeah, and with my work, I'd say there are certainly opportunities for communities to um, partner with RSDP to do some of the projects that I'm encouraging them to do. So um, with stormwater runoff in their communities or if it's um, out on public land, um, different projects or best management practices that they might choose to implement, I think there's um, possibilities for collaboration there. Awesome. That's great. And uh, speaking of best practices, just one final question. Um, the uh, Green Step Cities framework has come up a lot in, in different regions for um, a way that communities are pursuing these developments of their communities. Um, and they specifically call out in their best practices um, stormwater maintenance and other kind of water quality related things. And, um, I think trails are really well integrated into that framework too. Um, are either of you familiar with the Green Step program? And if so, how are your um, entities connected to that? Oh, I am familiar with the program. Um, um, I've gone through, I know my nearest community is Fergus Falls, and I know that they have um, become a, a part of that program. With my work, we are not yet connected, but it's interesting to hear you say that there's been a lot of interest in it. So it might be a, another way for us to connect with communities to work with them specifically on um, some of the parts of that plan that tie in really strongly with my work. So it might be a way we could connect with them. I have not done enough uh, checking on it, I guess, to, to know how many communities are, are participating. And with our work, I think oftentimes as planners, we're uh, we're handing it off to the engineers by the time that green steps uh, could be uh, in, in, implemented into a project. So I'm not super familiar with it. Personally, I know that there's been a lot of uh, different folks, you know, regularly communicating with the uh, elected officials and staff on, particularly on the North Shore, where there does have a unique environment um, regarding all kinds of uh, uh, environmental best practices, and I can certainly look into our design processes and how to incorporate green steps into it. Great, yeah, I can send you more info. It's just it's been a pretty hot topic lately, um, especially in Northwest where I live. So um, it's just interesting to hear how you know all the work that you all are doing are are leading into um, or or supplementing the this, uh, whole framework of best best practices that green step supports. So. Um, great. Well, thank you so much for being here and for presenting, um, and thank you for folks uh, tuning in. Um, again, this will be recorded and available on our YouTube page and also on our webinar home site, which is down at the bottom, v.umn.edu slash RSDP webinar, where you can find that. Um, our next webinar will be September 1st. We'll be hearing from Karen Oberhauser from the uh, UMN Monarch Lab and Monarch Joint Venture. And also Alicia uh, from the Sustainable Sheep and Fiber Community, which is a project that's being supported out of Northwest region um, and is kind of in line with a lot of the fiber supply chain work that the partnerships are doing statewide. Um, so tune in on September 1st, and uh, thank you all for tuning in. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.